Back in 2010, class of 1950 alumnus Roger Mudd, an extraordinary and well-known journalist in America, gave the university a generous gift for a center that would look into important ethical issues. At the time, back in 2010, Roger Mudd said, given the state of ethics in our current culture, this seems a fitting time to endow a center for the study of ethics, and my university is its fitting home. That's what Roger Mudd said in 2010. It was true then, it's, it's definitely true now. The center plays an important part in the life of the school by choosing a topic every year, a broad topic of ethical importance. This year's topic is the ethics of technology. Not a day goes by without all of us reading in a newspaper or on the internet something about the technological revolution and about the many issues um, that that revolution has brought about. Such things as gene editing, altering human DNA, artificial intelligence and robotics in the workplace and elsewhere. Um, big tech firms like Facebook and Google and the other ones, their practices, their handling of private information, uh, issues relating to cybersecurity, in which in a number of noted situations people have hacked into seemingly secure institutions. So we pick that broad topic, the ethics of technology, and we began then to put together a schedule of speakers from outside the university and from within some of our own talent. And we've come up with a very exciting, I think, schedule for this year's ethics theme. Our keynote speaker is a bioethicist, lawyer, and scholar and researcher into the whole area of gene editing, gene modification, altering of human DNA. And her name is Josephine Johnston. She's the head research scholar at an entity called the Hastings Center in the state of New York. She has a new book coming out called Human Flourishing in the Age of Gene Editing. So she's bringing a philosophical, ethical perspective to some extremely important scientific developments. We've all read about the Chinese scientist who some months ago said that he had altered the DNA of two microscopic embryos that later developed into human persons and are now born. The question of what are the ethical limits of such practices. And Josephine Johnson is going to lead us through the evolution of that question over time. And then she's going to pick a specific application connected to gene editing. She's going to look at the good parent in our culture today. Does the good parent alter the genetic makeup of its children? Does the good parent look into all of this? Does the good parent do anything? Uh, to make use of sec technologies. How should we think about this? What ethical values should be part of the culture's consideration of this topic? We're very excited about that as the kickoff um, speaker for this year's series.
Hello, how y'all doing? Is this uh, is this on? Can you hear? It? Test, test, test. Can you hear me? Hmm. Uh, <laughs> let's see. It's a button that says "Call for help." Oh, there it is. Like now, I can hear myself. <laughs> then I didn't have to push the help button. That's good. Um, so, um, so as you may know, the Roger Mudd Center for Ethics each year chooses an ethics theme that will be the focus of our annual series. This year's theme is on the ethics of technology. So far, we've had speakers who have addressed parental responsibility in the age of gene editing technologies, the role of artificial intelligence in the context of evolution and world history, and most recently, a talk on robots that are programmed to deceive. Today's talk is on the issue of privacy in the digital age. There are perhaps few, if any, core societal values that have been more challenged in the 21st century than privacy. There are also few, if any, scholars and theoreticians who've done more to help us understand privacy in the data and information age than today's speaker, Professor Helen Nissenbaum. We are extremely honored, grateful, and excited to have her with us today. Helen Nissenbaum is Professor of Information Science at Cornell Tech. Her work spans societal, ethical, and political dimensions of information technology and digital media. Professor Nissenbaum's books include Obfuscation, A User's Guide for Privacy and Protest, Values at Play in Digital Games, and Privacy in Context, Technology, Policy, and the Integrity of Social Life. Grants from the National Science Foundation, Air Force of Scientific Research, Air Force Office of Scientific Research, Ford Foundation, the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services Office of the National Coordinator, and the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency have supported her research. Recipient of the 2014 Barwise Prize of the American Philosophical Association, Professor Nissenbaum has contributed to privacy-enhancing software, including Track Me Not for protecting against profiling based on web search, and Ad Nauseam, protecting against profiling based on ad clicks. Both are free and freely available. So without further ado, please welcome Professor Helen Nissenbaum. Jeremy, I, I also want to say how firstly delightful I am to be here. Thanks for inviting me. And also, it's actually wonderful to um, learn about Jeremy's work because sometimes um, having worked on privacy for so many years, I'm like, when we need to see the next generation of privacy scholars and advocates, and um, you're very lucky that you have. Jeremy here um, doing that and teaching you about privacy. All right, so um, I have a fair bit that I'm going to try and go through and a little uncertain of the timing. So here is, here's the overview of the talk. Part one, it's, it's a simple overview. Part one, the regulatory dodge. I'm going to describe it, and um, hopefully you'll be shocked and amazed by it. Part two, I'll discuss my theory of privacy as contextual integrity. And then in the a brief conclusion, I'll, I'll juxtapose those two things together. Now, the way I'll go through the presentation is there'll be some high-level claims, and then at times I'm going to dive into the weeds and hopefully you'll follow along both of them. But I want to be sh the, the points that I'm, I want to be sure that you'll grasp, I'll try and emphasize those so that um, you would be able to see the arguments that I'm trying to make. So let's, let's start already um, with part one, which is the regulatory dodge. And I, and I want to say that this is, this is a term that I've used. I started using it a few years ago. I haven't written anything on it, but as, in fact, as I was working on this lecture, I thought to myself, you know, this is really important. Uh, not that, oh, this is really important work, but rather what's going on 
with technology and what I've called the regulatory dodge is really important and people, in my view, are not paying attention. There are some who are paying attention. And so, you know, writing this lecture, working on this lecture has enabled me to start thinking more rigorously and I would welcome your feedback because the ideas are not really fully formed. So um, here goes. What, what do we mean? What, is the, what are the origins of, 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 okay, so let's start, you know, the origins of privacy regulation in the information data or digital age. Some people will argue that privacy just emerged in 1895 with Warren and Brandeis lecture on the right to privacy. I don't think so. As long as people live together, privacy, as I understand it, has always been a value. But in 1965, there was a proposal in the US to merge all the increasing numbers of computerized databases that existed. Now, people didn't have laptops. We're talking about computers that filled huge rooms. And it was typically large institutions like hospitals and banks and government agencies that had them. But they had them all over the show. And this proposal was you know, the, the National Research Council in 1960, why don't we just merge them all together? And this caused a major outcry and totalitarianism was floated and we were looking to uh, the Soviet, the Soviet totalitarian state and so forth. And, and, and 1984, we didn't want any of that. So the Secretary of Health, Education and Welfare um, created a committee that was going to look at computerized systems uh, just generally, information, nobody used the terms digital, but it was computerized information systems. And in 1973, so they started working in 1972, Alan Weston, um, who some of you may have heard about, uh, one of the very early great scholars of, of um, privacy led, no, I think he was part of this uh, committee. And they came up with this, this code of fair information practices, which is um, affectionately abbreviated to FIPS, and I might use that term, FIPS. And basically, here's, here's like the original version, but there, there are numerous versions. And one thing you keep in mind is that even if you fast forward to the GDPR, which is the EU's brand new privacy regulation, FIPS is, funda is fundamental. It's, it's the skeleton of that. So the, the, the main ideas are that there shouldn't be secret databases. Uh, people should know what about them is in the databases and how the data or information is being. By the way, I use data and information into, um, without any distinction. There are people who carefully think there's a hierarchy and so forth. I, I don't buy that, so I'll just use those terms interchangeably. Um, there has to be a purpose for the collection of the data, that there's a purpose that has to be specified. And the use of that data has to be limited by that purpose. So you can't collect for one purpose and then just go ahead and use it for some other purpose. People have a right to correct and amend the data that institutions hold about them. And institutions have an obligation to um, keep, keep the systems secure and reliable. So th those are the basic ideas. And in 1974, there was a Privacy Act passed. Uh, tragically, some of us think that uh, applied only to government agencies, but not to anybody else. Now, underneath this code of fair information practices, and, and what, what, what's interesting is that although it was labeled as a privacy, as, as a as articulating rights to privacy, the code was for fair information practices because the idea was that the party that's gathering the data has, has greater power than those who are the data subjects. And so the terms that this committee used was leveling the playing field. 
And they um, held fast to the idea of privacy as a right to control information about ourselves. And that is probably the dominant way that people think about privacy today. I think that that's a problem. And when I talk about contextual in integrity, I'll explain. And now, because it was the Privacy Act of 1974 was limited only to government, what are we experiencing today when, when you go online, when you use an app, when you use a device, when you go anywhere, is a privacy policy. And this approach is called notice and choice. And the idea, and the FTC, the Federal Trade Commission, for the most part, manages this whole process. The idea is that we kind of follow the fair information practice principles we tell people, if you, if you look at how many people have ever read a privacy policy, all the way through, all the way through. <laughs> She's like, shakes her head, no, no, that, that, that much boredom I cannot handle. So in, anyway, the, it, it's a, it follows, it tries to, first of all, tell you that the data is being collected, what it is, what they're doing with it, and so forth. If you look at the privacy policies, there's, at this point, there's kind of a boilerplate structure, and um, here is, uh, this is quite an old one. I'm sure by now it's much older, and I don't know, I don't know why I'm always showing shoes as an example, but so be it. Um, here was Google's privacy and terms of service, and the thing that I magnified is we change this privacy policy from time to time. We will not reduce your rights under this policy without your explicit consent. We always indicate the date and, you know, check back often. So those of you who haven't read a privacy policy through, you should actually read numerous privacy policies because they keep changing and you have an obligation. So. What is the trouble with notice and consent? And I'm going to be brief because there's a lot of work that's out there, really good work that's out there that actually has challenged whether this is working at all. I mean, remember that this is, this, even if you, do, if, even if you accept that privacy is the right to control, you ask yourself the question, to what extent um, it, does notice and choice actually, actually operationalize this idea of, of control. So first of all, if you remember what the Google Terms of Service says, you know, you, we, you ha we grant you this right. Opt-in and opt-out has been a long-standing debate. For the, most of the time, it's, it's opt-out. So you're opted in automatically. The default is opt-in. and the statistics are very clear that people will generally not opt out and also it's a hassle and, and also. So that is an issue around which there's a lot of disagreement. GDPR tries to change it. Um, unsuccessfully, I might add, how many people, you know, you've got this pop-up. We, we use cookies. Click here if you don't. And you're like, what happens if I... Click or don't click, nobody, okay. So what are the troubles with notice? You know, those privacy policies, they're not read. I mean, the statistic, this is, this is typical. I've only read them because I teach them in my courses and so I have to. They're unreadable. Now, what do I mean by that? Alicia McDonald and Laurie Craner did a study in which they actually counted, if you actually read and then went back and reread when they changed, it would take about a month of your lifetime to actually read these policies. So when people don't read it, I think we're being quite rational not to read them because we'd rather be doing other important things like going to the gym, for example. They're incomprehensible, and that's uh, tested not only on, on, on non-experts, but this has been tested on experts. 
and I do this exercise, you can challenge yourself, you know, read it carefully and then start asking some questions about is this or that, um, can it happen? Joe Turo thinks that um, they're so divergent, these policies from what people expect, that they actually shouldn't be called privacy policies. They should just be called information policies. And um, some concerns I've had is that they're asymmetric in knowledge and power, and, and, and we offer, you know, they offer users a take it or leave it condition. They're one-to-one -one unilateral offerings um, and suggest that privacy is a private good only. And then, of course, the enforcement challenges right now, um, someone has to complain if, if a company hasn't. So what happens is that a company can say whatever they like in a privacy policy, and the only thing is if they break what they said, then the FTC can come after them. But there's very little that stops them from writing. They could say, we collect all your data and we sell it to absolutely anybody that offers a profit to us. That could be in the privacy policy. But as long as you don't violate it, you, you know, good for you. Now, um, this is very depressing and it, it, despite all of this evidence, there's so much evidence we, we aren't moving away from. However, in parallel to this particular approach, we also have areas where Congress believes that need extra protection, just like the Privacy Act of 1974 honed in on government agencies, but um, other areas, and for various reasons that I won't go into, have managed to pass substantive privacy regulations. When I say substantive, I mean the opposite of procedural. It's not like if the person consents, it's okay, but it's rather do this, don't do that, and so forth. And, and more or less, these are far from perfect. We have financial privacy rules that governs the financial sector. Um, many of you probably now, you go to your doctor's offices, you have to sign waivers. That's HIPAA, which was a health, um, health privacy rules, uh, FERPA, which are education privacy rules, and, you know, this weird anomaly video rental um, privacy <laughs> protection. And I, I won't go into the story. If you want, I'll tell you later. Okay. So this is what the rules look like. And um, so th this one is... Um, this one is the GLBA privacy, that, that's HIPAA, the HIPAA privacy rules, and you can see the various parts of it. I mean, they're very long. And um, here we have the, the FERPA, and um, that's the VPPA, which is video rentals. So this is normally what these rules say. They'll, they'll sometimes talk about the purpose of the privacy rules, who, who the covered entities are, and what types of information are concerning, and what conditions must cover the transfer. So often they'll say uh, that you, you're not allowed to transfer this data to a third advertising party or any other third parties except if it's law enforcement with proper authorization, blah, blah. So there's that, and then sometimes uses are constrained, um, and and at what junctures should the data subjects be consulted and when they don't have to be consulted. Now, what is the great regulatory dodge that I've been talking about? This artful device to evade, deceive, or trick. Let's now, we're here we are in the world of apps, platforms, and devices. Here, I had done a little bit of research on health apps and add-ons and um, devices, and you can see some of, some of what's available. This is some. I mean, there are thousands of health and lifestyle apps and devices, and I just showed a selection. So some of it is pretty 
you know, mental health, diabetes management, and so forth. And here are some of the health tracking tech, and I just want to highlight one of them, which is, which is this one, which is um, a fertility monitor, and I don't think there's much more, you know, there isn't much more intimate than that. So you could ask yourself the question, are these covered by HIPAA? And the answer is no. This is how all of these devices and systems are regulated. The same notice and choice approach where no one reads, it can say anything it likes, and so forth. That's what I mean by the dodge. Now, there's lots of different types of dodges. Uh, some of you may have heard that Facebook has, has, is now you know, um, about to come out with Calibra, which is uh, a, a um, cryptocurrency, and um, Facebook assures people that its products will not source. So GLBA, Graham Leach Bliley Financial Privacy Rules, we don't know, but one thing they, the financial privacy rules say is that if you're part of, if you're an affiliate, the data can flow without, without needing consent. So, warning, warning. <laughs> okay. And then things like this where you have strong professional codes, but now we have the direct to public legal apps. They're not covered by those codes and there are people worrying about that particular situation. And then finally this. So uh, on your website, we have a commitment to FERPA, Education Records Policy. FERPA is very imperfect. It, it's, it, it badly needs updating. It only applies to institutions that accept government help and so on. But the idea is that there are important regulations to protect students. Now we have an, this family of, of MOOCs or uh, virtual learning environments, which is a large family. Here also are some of the, just a few, like a small handful of the MOOCs that you can um, utilize. Here is Coursera's, and I'm going to just focus a little bit on Coursera. Um, from courses to degrees, the 100% online learning from the world's best universities, and so on. And here is what Daphne Kohler had said about Coursera. This is supposed to make you happy and impressed. I'm going to let you read it. Okay. Now, question. FERPA or FIPS. This is education, works with universities, nice happy pictures of students. See? Education, top universities. Answer? Here it is. The privacy policy, and like almost, uh, I don't, I haven't seen one recently that doesn't say about changes to. We review, we change, we'll notify you um, how. We'll post the notice on our site. Check back, because things could have changed. So that's the regulatory dodge. We have regulation for sectors, but many of the online providers or app mobile providers are offering services where they present themselves not as subject to those particular regulations. And that's what I've called the dodge. Part two is now privacy is contextual. So just, just hold that thought. And I want to talk a little bit about the theory of privacy as contextual integrity, which um, I have a book and lots of papers that where I'm trying to develop it and apply it. It's all, it continues to be a work in progress. It was stimulated by these families of technologies, and I keep adding to the list. It wasn't as a philosopher trying to understand the concept of privacy, but it's trying to understand all of these technologies that have been emerging, um, as Jeremy had mentioned, raise this concern about privacy. People freak out. They protest. 
And the question I was interested in is, what is it about what these technologies are doing that causes people to respond in this particular way? And that's how I developed the theory of contextual integrity, which is what the way I'm going to um, go through it with you is by detailing the four key ideas of this theory. And when I go through these ideas, one of the ways that I'll um, reveal them to you is by distinguishing that each of the ideas respectively from some of the more um, common, commonly expressed theories of privacy. So the first of these is that privacy or contextual integrity is about appropriate flow of information. And this is important because particularly in the computer science community, you would hear computer scientists talk about, oh, the leaking of data. You can you give up your privacy for some utility. And this is really important because whenever you hear that from now on, everybody in this room, whenever you see someone say that, you must immediately say, are you giving up privacy or are you sharing information? Because not all flows of information compromise privacy. The idea is that sharing, flowing of information is a good thing. It's a positive thing for society. We wouldn't want to valorize a, um, something like privacy if it meant secrecy. It means, so the first claim is, appropriate flow. What we're after is appropriate flow and pushes back against this idea of privacy as secrecy. Now naturally you would want to say what is appropriate flow and, and then the rest of the theory is, is trying to do that. Uh, I haven't um, miscounted even though it's one, two, four because there will be a three but um, four is the is the final key idea, and I'm going to spend a little bit of time with two. So, appropriate flow is flow that conforms with norms or rules. And the idea is that we have expectations of how information will flow. And what happens with technology is it disrupts these expectations. So, one of the examples I like to use is Google Maps Street View. When Street View came out, people freaked out. And Google's response was, why are you freaking out? Your houses and the streets and so on, they're public. So public is public. We're just putting it up on the web. And people, like th that just seemed like a knockdown argument. What contextual integrity would say is that there was a significant disruption of flow and people were shocked, and their response was protest. Because we, are, we have these expectations. Now, a little bit further with contextual integrity is a theory of society, which is that it's not just undifferentiated social space, but that society is constructed of social domains or social realms, not my idea. Some of you here have read social philosophy or sociolo theories of sociology. Even in the legal domain, we have different types of law. You have commercial law, you may have health law, you may have family law. And these all communicate that we have different sectors. So the, the, at the base of contextual integrity is context, social context. And contexts are, are social spheres. They're defined by purposes and goals. What's the goal of the healthcare context? Um, I mean, it's, this is a very actually challenging. What's the goal of education? And what are the values? So you might say in healthcare, uh, it's to alleviate pain and so forth. And around that, the activities, the practices, the institutions, and the norms. And the norms that we care about here are the informational norms. These are the norms that govern flow of information. So when you have conformance with contextual informational norms, everybody's pretty much happy. I mean, 
asterisk. And the, the structure of the informational norms, I'm not going to pause here for too long, is, is part of the theory, and this is the key idea number three, which is that when you're trying to characterize norms, you know, let's say you're, you're studying or you want to express a rule or you're trying to map an existing flow, you need to say, you need to identify the actors acting in contextual capacities. So, subject of the information, the sender of the information, and the recipient of the information. And often the sender and the subject are the same, so that when you enter your physician's office, the physician asks you, you know, tell me about your experiences, and you say, well, you know, my knees really sore when I bend it, blah, blah, blah. So, you are sending, you're the subject and the physician's the recipient. Information type is this, the complaints, and the transmission principle are the constraints or conditions under which the information flows. And I hope in the meanwhile you've been reading all the bottom stuff because I wanted to, you know, just give you a, an idea of different kinds of context and, and the different values for these parameters, because I'm, I'm not going to go through everything on the slide. Now, what's important here is that um, all the parameters matter. When I show you just these intuitive sentences, like a citizen of the United States is obliged to reveal gross annual income to the Internal Revenue Service under conditions of confidentiality except as required by law. That is a rule. And by the way, I use the term rule and norm. I had been talking about contextual integrity to computer scientists and finally a good friend <clears throat> said, yeah, this is all very promising. What's a norm? You know, so, because computer scientists use the term in a different way. So, I mean, just for, for those of you who enjoy multidisciplinary activities, sometimes the language can be a barrier. <clears throat> so anyway, rule, but they needn't be rules that are embedded in law. They, so if you, you know, um, here parents should monitor their K through 12 children's academic performance with or without the child's consent. I don't know that there's a, a law, not really, you know, but it's an expectation and parents who don't are maybe considered as not doing what they should do, but it's more some assumptions that we have very culturally uh, specific and, and so on in a job interview forbidden to I'm asking the candidate here. Okay, so the transmission principle is quite an important part of the story because if you think about um, say police entering a house, we, we require that they have a warrant. So law enforcement cannot go and just collect any information they want, they need to have a warrant. So this idea that there's a constraint on how you, how the information flows is quite important, though it has been very confusing <clears throat> to people. I'm not sure um, whether it will be material to where we're going, but I just wanted to spotlight that. <clears throat> so now back to where we were with the second key idea, the we have that practices, information practices, must conform with these contextual informational norms. Now, um, pay attention to the fact that this is purely descriptive. I'm talking about the norms or expectations that people happen to have. And so the first step of the way is to say that we expect information to flow a certain way. When Google Maps Street View says public is public and you in your heart know there's a huge difference between somebody walking by your house and seeing you and that picture being posted on the web. 
And one of those differences is in the first case, there's reciprocity. They see you, you see them. But when you post something on the web, you have no idea who's looking. Same with surveillance apparatus that law enforcement might post on for in, in an open square that may say public is public, but you've lost reciprocity when you move to the technology. So here is a huge uh, distinguisher from the fair information practice principles because we're, re we're rejecting the idea of a procedural approach. The procedural approach says we can do anything blah, 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 as long as you consent. Here we're saying there are substantive constraints on information flow, and if you violate those constraints, you're in trouble. I'm just going to skip this. This is just to show that actually some of the, those laws that I was showing you, this is from HIPAA, um, actually fit very well with the format of the contextual integrity norms. Okay, this is ethics. This, this is an ethics center. And so far, I've mainly been descriptive because I've just said, stick with what people expect and everybody's going to be happy. But technology is disruptive, and that isn't always a bad thing. We have scientific discoveries. So if you go back to the Hippocratic Oath, which says the physician shouldn't say anything to anybody, now we know diseases can be infectious, contagious, they can be caused by toxic chemicals. If we don't have appropriate flow of the information, we are, we are losing out on all these kinds of tech disruptions and the scientific discovery and their social change. We, our, our relationships, families, cultures, their social change and the norms must change. But what we need is some way, and now we get to the legitimacy, that these are worth defending. They're morally justifiable. How do you argue when you're looking, and there are two possibilities, because sometimes people point out to the fact that technologies can allow you to do things that we could not do before. You might have a thermal imaging apparatus that allows you to see heat patterns through a wall. We could ne a wall was a, it was a complete barrier. Now we can kind of sense stuff going on behind a wall. We don't have norms for seeing through, norm, through walls. We need, we need to figure that out. Sometimes we have changes, like Facebook's newsfeed is different in, than some of the ways that we communicate to friends, friends, I hate the fact that they've taken that term because it was such a great term and now, now it's just. So the, the argument, the, this is, and this is, it requires some delicacy, is that we need to go through some processes. We need to consider in like the in the first layer of analysis, the interests of the different parties who are affected by these information flows. Who are the winners? Who are the losers? So there's been a lot of discussion about, for example, um, ad tech. Nowadays, we have um, algorithmic decision systems that help employers identify finalists for a job. We have so many different systems. And in the rush to automation, many people are concerned that the error, the error rates are actually higher for some groups of people over others. Only some, and this, I'm sure you know, you've been reading racial disparities, gender disparities, and so we ask when you institute a certain scheme, who are the winners and who are the losers? And that's what we mean by interests and pre preferences of the affected parties. And this, in this way, contextual integrity asks us to take individuals into consideration. So when a company knows a lot about you and decides to serve you ads that 
it knows you would be vulnerable to, or they can manipulate you based on what they know about you, then we can see this power imbalance has a deleterious impact because companies know a lot about us and they formulate profiles and so forth. I mean, th this is very sophisticated. It can be even things like, I mean, many of you may have re read about data breaches because um, it's cheap to store data and companies never want to throw data out. But what happens is that there's, it's very hard to secure the data and there are breaches constantly. The breaches, are, we don't have a law at the moment. It's very difficult for an individual to show that they've been harmed through a data breach. And so at the moment, the parties who are bearing the greatest burden are the individual. So we just, it's just that kind of analysis. Interests and preferences, this is not uncom uncommon in the policy domain to do this kind of interest-based analysis. Second are these issues of, of, of ethical and political principles. And I talked about inequality, bias, injustice, fairness, and so on. So. Uh, many, there's, there's a huge, I think, a very large and rich literature in the privacy community looking at things like freedom of speech or freedom of choice. If people are watching over you, you may be concerned about what you say and so forth. So there are values that are protected by privacy. And this is a societal consideration. And the third is the one I think that, so all of these, there's, there's a lot of work going on in this. The third that, that um, I want to draw your attention to, and that's specific to contextual integrity, is to notice that the appropriate flow of information affects the achievement of certain contextual functions, purposes, and values. And let me just say what I mean. If we now, we're now going back to what it is that defines a context. Contexts are oriented around values and purposes. So here are just some, you know, back of the envelope. Here's where the privacy scholar has to step back. And I think the pity of it is often you'll see private dis privacy discussions, um, say, with the FTC and so forth. And, it's us, you know, it's the privacy advocates who are in the room. It shouldn't only be us. It should be the area experts. We need the principals and the superintendents and the parents to be talking about the goals of education and what the rules should be. We should have the people who provide the health care telling us what the goals are so we can come up with the right kinds of rules to make sure that those are promoted and so forth. So these are some of the thoughts, and you can see they're different, and they probably require different kinds of rules to promote different kinds of ends and purposes. Now, I'm just, this is a really random, because I've heard so many people talk about Facebook and Cambridge Analytica, and always, even in really high-quality news outlets, I consider NPR to be one of those, or the New York Times, <clears throat> they would say, oh, isn't it a shame that Facebook shared information with Cambridge Analytica without your permission? Now, without your permission, you've just told me that you don't read privacy policies. So you might have already given your permission. Do you know you didn't? I mean, OK. so." That's not the problem with Cambridge Analytica and everything that happened as a result of it. It's this. It's, it's the fact that it destabilizes de stabilized democracy as we know it. It threatens fundamental political values. That's the problem with Cambridge Analytica. But to keep harping on the fact that, oh, if only it had been aligned in the privacy policy, things might have been different. I don't think so. So here is, the, is um, the difference between uh, contextual integrity and some of the 
dominant approaches to privacy. And I want to stress this. First of all, privacy isn't always contrary to other values. Good rules are balanced rules and promote multiple values. That's what it is to be appropriate. They're not always contrary to societal values in particular, and they're not always promoting the interests of the data subject. The way many people think about privacy at the moment is very much as an individual good, and you always have to battle against those who say society needs to also be taken into consideration, so we're going to damp down the right to privacy. This is just a summary of the main points, and this, because if you walk away and remember only one thing out of this entire talk, it's just this. This will stand you in good stead. So we reach the conclusion, and it's just I'm nearly at the end, because this is where the, this is the tough part. How do we see this regulatory dodge? If we go to this question of what are, the, what are the norms for education, what are the purposes and value, of course, it depends on what we think those purposes and values are. If we think that it's, you know, job training, that's all that education is about, or reading, writing, arithmetic, then we may have one idea of what those rules should be. We may think that it's okay for schools to just ship off what their students' performance was without even asking any of the parents, for example, because it's all about job training and the economy. When you're talking about intellectual development, intellectual freedom, and so forth, you have something in mind. Now, with the MOOCs, The concern is that the MOOC takers present as if you're a student, but treat you like a consumer. And, in, and they're, they're very different ways that we have of treating students and consumers. And here are just some of the things that come to mind, and again, I'm going to be finishing in a couple of minutes, so I want to remind you the relationship we have with some of the commercial websites that are run by Notice and Choice, and some of the issues with it, and what we would like, now I say ideal sectoral regulation, because we don't actually have ideal sectoral regulation at the moment, we're still struggling with what that looks like, particularly with FERPA. But we see a huge difference. And I just like this quote, that do we want schools to become this kind of domain where we, we have a kind of adversarial relationship? So my own proposition is that we confront the dodge we insist that what we must pursue is educational integrity. Developing information rules, and it could be any kind of integrity, it could be healthcare integrity, it could be financial integrity, and so on. And I actually wish we would have lots more sectoral approaches than we do today. We have a few, but we need lots more. The rules that fully specify, and, and this is something I forgot to say, but we've done studies, um, Kirsten Martin and I have done now a, a series of three empirical studies where we demonstrate that if you don't, if, if you don't actually specify all the parameters, values for all the parameters, then people read, they interpret, they see that sentence ambiguously. So if you don't say who you're sharing with, people will fill in the blank themselves, and it makes a difference. So we need the rules to specify everything and be mindful of the ends, purposes, and values of the context, and that's when we'll have contextual integrity, and that's when we will stymie the dodge.
Thank you. Um, thank you so much for the talk. I was wondering um, what happens on your account of contextual integrity when, um, when the expectations have changed and solidified around something that is um, suboptimal with respect to the goals and values. Yeah. Right? And so, so for example, Lots of people my age or older complain that millennials don't have any expectation of privacy anymore, right? And, and so the things that are happening um, kind of aren't contrary to those expectations. And what, just yeah. do you have any yeah. thoughts on that? Yeah. yeah. Um, no, that's a, that's a great question. I don't agree with that. First of all, I don't, I don't think that millennials don't have expectations of privacy. They have different expectations of privacy. And um, one of the, one of the, and this is why you need the normative and also the descriptive, if you will, part of the theory, because you can have norms that are entrenched mistakenly entrenched in a society. For example, we, we've had certain gender roles entrenched in society, and as we change the structure of society, we start to see that those norms are problematic and uh, norms change. So, sometimes, um, so what the recommendation from the perspective of contextual integrity is that we need to be performing these analyses in earnest, and if we are going to pass regulation, we need to have an understanding of the consequences of. So it's, I would argue that a lot of what we see, because the, um, there's this thing called the privacy paradox where the claim is that people will say, yeah, we love privacy, but then they'll do all sorts of things that suggest the opposite. One, there are many reasons, but one of the reasons is that people have no clue what is happening and what the potential, the consequences of their activities are. And a lot of the behaviors we're seeing is, are that. So I think it's, it's education, it's um, the other shoe, you know, seeing the other shoe drop and, um, and then sometimes it's us to say, well, why were we being so uptight about you know, this or that? But, but the, at, the, at the core of it is this ethical analysis that needs to be done. Thank you. So I have two questions that have nothing to do with each other. But uh, the first is GDPR. Is it a good thing? And um, will the U.S. ever adopt it? I hear Canada may. So that's one. And the other is, um, I, in, in my opinion, there's a lot of confusion in the public about security versus privacy. And security and sorry. Security versus privacy. Oh, mm -hmm. That they're really, uh, it's a relationship that goes hand in hand. And you can have too much security, which reduces privacy, but you cannot have privacy without security, and, and, and at least in the information systems world. So I'm just curious about your thoughts on that and whether that's Accurate. Well, well, the, well, the first, the second point about security and privacy, I agree. And often, um, especially in the in the early computer literature, we would computer science literature on privacy. Often, um, they would be talking about security when, in fact, they sorry, they would be using the term privacy when, in fact, they meant security. And I and I. And that may be the root of this idea in computer science that privacy and secrecy are the same thing. Because you'd have that model of Alice and Bob and 
the whole point was that Alice and Bob should be able to have a conversation with one another and not have Eve <laughs> eavesdrop. And um, that is security. It's also privacy, but it's it, in some sense, you know, in some under some conditions. But it's mainly this question of strong encryption and and so forth. So yes. I don't know what to say. We, for me, it was like case by case. What's the key thing? The question about GDPR is, is interesting. Of course, the US is never going to adopt anything that was made in Europe. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but I like the US sectoral approach if it were done right. The GDPR takes, still has, as I had mentioned, the skeleton of the fair information practice principle inside of it. And the fundamental issue I have with it, with FIPS, is that it says you, can, you need to specify, look, there are lots of parts of it, but, but, the, but the core problem is that it says you need to, it, it, you need to specify the purposes for the collection and then the use has to be consistent with the purpose specification. But it doesn't say what are the legitimate purposes. And so you can have a company that just says this, you know, we're doing this, we're gonna, we wanna make a profit. That's our purpose. And that really, and we're never gonna use the data in any other way except to promote the purpose. So I have a problem with FIPS. That's my main problem with FIPS. And then, of course, you know, as long as the person says yes and none of us read the policies, like, that's the story. But GDPR does try to do something. It tries to talk about legitimate purposes. And so it does try to limit the purposes according to something. Now, I would l I've tried to, you know, go to these... GDPR, you know, commissioners and so on, I say, you know what would be a legitimate purpose? Contextually appropriate. You know, I say, if you're a bank, then this is the legitimate purpose and we specify it according to the context. So that's my hope. My hope is like speak to enough people, GDPR, and then, and then we're talking sectoral because then each of the entities that are being regulated, the data processes, will need to live by certain rules depending on what context they're operating in. So that's, that's my happy dream. Th thanks for the talk. It was really interesting. Um, <clears throat> I'm wondering about consent. And so um, a lot of your argument against the sort of consent model was based on these, uh, on these statements, which nobody reads and couldn't understand if they did. But there are a lot of other ways to approach consent, right? Mm -hmm. So in a healthcare context, uh, you know, when you consent to a medical procedure, yeah. um, it's thoroughly explained and you have to sign and... and so um, maybe I got the wrong impression, but do you want to throw consent out the door altogether, or is there a place for it? There's definitely a place for it. And in, in one of the articles that I wrote a few years ago, um, I, I, I looked at some of the um, informed consent literature, particularly in the biomedical domain. And what I realized is, I mean, there, there are two things. First of all, just in the structure of contextual integrity, consent is one of the transmission principles. So there are times where the flow of information needs consent. So it definitely has a role. And even, you know, like when you're talking with friends and um, it's consensual. The, the, the flow of information is consensual, whereas when you're filing your tax return, you're being compelled to
to provide certain information. However, coming back to the question of consent, the notice and choice regime tries to put everything into this privacy policy and then says you've consented. When you go and you're about to have surgery, let's say you're having heart surgery, I'll bet you that the doctor didn't say to you, I mean, I'm just saying, <laughs> do you want silicone tubing or rubber tubing? You know, if, if you were going to consent to everything, they, they would ask you those questions. And do you want to be operated by someone, he's really good, he doesn't have a medical degree, but, but he's, he's really great with his hands, you know. So, so there's, there's, there's a whole set of regulations that society has put in place so that when you're consenting, you can rely on this whole web of confidence that's built. But with information flows, we don't have anything. Once we have those, then I think consent will continue to play an important role. Yeah, great challenge. I think. <laughs> yes, thanks very much for your talk. I'm, I have a question about the, the normative analysis, mm -hmm. and in particular, the role of the social and political and cultural values in that analysis, yeah. and wondering. Um, how your view is going to deal with the fact that different societies, of course, might yeah. have quite different political and social yeah. and cultural values. And yet a lot of these platforms, of course, are transnational. Yeah. And, and so do you have yeah. thoughts about, you know, the, yeah. again, cultural relativism versus, a, you know, objective yeah. norms? And have you thought through some of those issues? I mean, that, so that was often given, and there's a chapter in my book when I'm looking at this exact question. Because some of, the, some of the antagonists of strong privacy would say privacy is, is, is not a human right because if you look across different cultures, they're vastly different norms. From the point of view of contextual integrity, actually that observation makes a lot of sense because if, if you consider that the norms of flow emerge from social structure, then you would expect the norms to be different. You know, if, 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 if the, the healthcare regime looks, is different, you're going to have different, or if family structures are different, maybe you have tribes rather than nuclear families, you would expect to see different flows of information. So in a way, and, and what I would love, and it hasn't happened except in one tiny case, is that I would love people to study societies to try and actually look at some of the expectations of flow in relation to some of these social structures and see if I'm right. You know, see whether, they, whether you can reason from them. Now, your other question, which, which is technology, we, want, we wanted to serve all. And I don't, I don't know what to say about that, and I actually like just we talking about ethics and technology as a as a large issue. Many cultures have complaints that this is, and so the answer will often be, oh, just just tell people what you're doing and see if they say okay. I mean that is so oversimplified because you some people cannot not be on Facebook for example, but the norms are completely arranged for them. I, I just think it's a big issue. People should keep on working. It's not just privacy, but yeah. Just go down. <laughs> That's okay. It's <laughs> like. <laughs> so some of your um, examples, you talk about healthcare, you talk about education. Um, there seems to be a, a broader purpose for it. It's health, it's, it's, a, it's a right, or it's education. <clears throat> but when we talk about the commercial aspect, yeah. um, some of the innovation comes from business and we don't know yet 
how they're going to, what data they could use to actually mm -hmm. give us a good we would, we would like. Yeah. So I, I guess I'm wondering about the makeup of who decides norms, particularly norms in areas that we don't even know we have yeah. yet, and, yeah. and particularly in the commercial yeah. sphere. Yeah. Ooh. Um, So I, I often don't touch on the commercial sphere just because I don't really know very much about it. Like I, I, I assume my colleague, so Kirsten Martin is an ethicist in, in the George Washington Business School and we work a lot together and she's interested in trust. So I want to take that as, if I were going to just launch from a point of <laughs> ignorance, I would, I would lay things out like trust, and I would say that um, in the commercial domain for a healthy relationship, you need, customers have to have trust, and so that some of the information flows, um, you can't just completely take advantage of people. On the other hand, um, when you ask about who defines, they're, they're two, first of all, norms exist. You could have Zuckerberg saying, actually I noticed recently that he changed his tune because years ago he said, Facebook has changed the norm. And the answer is no. Facebook has changed practice. It hasn't changed the norm. It may change the norm, but it hasn't changed the norm. The norm exists. But who gets to design the systems to de determine? And the answer is like, this is the Wild West at the moment. If you just take the online, if you, if you take the web, for example, and lots of people have, and, and mobile devices, there's data flowing, there are people you've never heard of who are gathering, like data brokers, for example, who are gathering information about us. And it's a, it's a free for all. The, the people who are defining the rules are the people who are building the systems and the people who are the companies, the startups, the venture capitalists, those are the people who are doing it, and they're doing it in the commercial domain, and they're doing it in all those other domains as well. And the, 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 the chilling part that some of us have started noticing is that this whole structure is now being pointed to manipulation. We are being presented with choices we make the choices, we don't even know why. And the choices are serving the interests of the people who are controlling the infrastructure. You can lock me up and tie my hand, but that's how paranoid I am about this whole thing. It's those are the people who are at the moment doing it. And a lot of, the, um, a lot of our regulators and ethicists and parents really don't know how to fight back against that. We need to know more. Our, our, our laws don't yet give us transparency into those systems. Maybe that's the first step. Well, you didn't ask me for solutions, but I'm just <laughs> giving that to you. Yeah. All right, well, thank you very much. Thanks to Professor Nissenbaum. <laughs> <laughs>